Um, but that's where she would have spent years of her life here. Um, and then Dredd arrives with Dr. Emerson in 1836, and they are married very soon afterwards, um, probably only three or four months after Dredd arrived, and that's when Harriet would have moved her entire life from the prairie and the Indian agency into the walls of the fort. Um, so Harriet, she had many skills. She would be um, hired out and used as a laundress or a cook or a nanny. And she was, when Emerson was gone, she was hired out to other officers, so she would have been uh, working in other kitchens. All of the kitchens on this side of the fort, basically. The commanding officer's house, the 12 kitchens of the officer's quarters, and the four kitchens of the hospital. In the four years that slavery was practiced here, this is where enslaved people would have lived as well as worked. There's no separate quarters. They, they lived and worked in the kitchens, primarily. Um, and so we know Harriet worked in the commanding officer's kitchen for a few months when she was um, rented out to Major Plumpton. Um, and Dredd was basically what they called a, a personal body servant. He's uh, with Dr. Emerson or whichever officer he's with. He's with them 24 hours a day, basically, to, to be on call for whatever they need. But with Dr. Emerson, that meant he was also helping with basic medical tasks. So in 1837, when Dr. Emerson is... Um, vaccinating 500 Dakota men for uh, smallpox, Dredd was actually helping administer the vaccinations as well. And he would do, um, you know, basic medical tasks like that. Uh, we also know Dr. Emerson was one of the signatories on the 1837 treaty uh, between the United States and the Ojibwe. That treaty was signed directly outside the front gates. There's a big meadow there now. But because Dredd was a body servant and Dr. Emerson was a signatory, that means Dredd would have been there for the five-day um, basically, it's like a five-day sort of get-together that, that culminates in this treaty signing. Dredd would have been there with Dr. Emerson for those five days. And because um, Harriet was um, uh, a cook, she would have also been there because there's a lot of feasting that happens in this five days. So there's a lot of uh, really significant events that they are a part of, uh, the treaty with the Ojibwe just being one of those events. Um, so they were here. Um, until around, and then their daughter Eliza was born actually on a boat. They were returning. They'd gone down south with Dr. Emerson for a while. And on their return, just after they had passed over into free territory on the Mississippi River, Eliza was born on the boat that they were traveling on. So she was actually born in a free territory, which means she should have been free from, from birth, basically. Pilgrim boat called Pilgrim Boat. Yes, that's boat. exactly what it was called. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so they left in 1840. I believe Eliza was probably about two or three years old at that time. Um, and so when they left here, they left with Dr. Emerson and ended up back in St. Louis. Dr. Emerson died pretty suddenly of a heart attack. And that's when they were uh, left under um, Irene Emerson, his widow. So I've read quite a few books on this. Some historians think that uh, Emerson and Dredd might have had an agreement for Dredd to, to purchase his family's freedom. However, this was not written down in Emerson's will. He died suddenly, so there was no record of this. Dredd did try to purchase his freedom from Irene, the widow, um, and she refused to allow them to purchase their freedom. Basically, when Dr. Emerson died, he left her with nothing. And um, according to historians, she would not let them purchase their freedom because their daughters were going to be worth a lot of money. Mm. And so she didn't want to give up that income. And that is when Dredd and Harriet turned to the court system instead to gain their freedom. Um, this court case is infamous because of what the Supreme Court decided, but it wasn't unusual. Before Dredd and Harriet brought their case to court, they had, um, St. Louis alone had 200 other freedom suits and uh, over half of them had resulted in freedom for the uh, enslaved person suing the person who had taken them to free territory. Basically, there was a legal doctrine called once free, always free. It's based off of an English law from the 18th century. If you have lived in a free territory, you cannot be put back into a position of slavery. And especially if you were a woman, this was um, a pretty good way to gain your freedom in the court system. Juries would find in favor of this legal argument. So when um, gosh, their 11 years in the court system is very convoluted, um, but essentially they first went to court in 1846 and their case was thrown out because the, of a, a legal technicality in the paperwork. And they weren't able to bring their case again for another few years because there was a cholera epidemic 
and then there was a big fire in downtown St. Louis, all these things that kept the courthouse closed. So really, they didn't get back into the courts until around 1850, 1851. And a lot of things have changed in those few years. I'm going to get some maps. Maps are always good for a case like this. So, to understand why the courts broke basically 30 years of legal precedent, let's look at these maps here and see the, um, the spread of slavery throughout the 19th century. Of course, we have the Northwest Ordinance, which declares where we are a free territory. It was supposed to be free forever, in the words of the, in the, words of the ordinance. Um, and then, by 1820, the United States is expanding. And the, the sectional divide of whether or not slavery would expand with the United States becomes apparent. This is why we have the Missouri Compromise in 1820. The compromise was, you know, they wanted to keep a balance of slave states and free states. And so Missouri would be admitted as a slave state, and Maine would be admitted as a free state, as long as slavery always stayed below this parallel, the 3630 parallel. Um, and then after that, it would be like in every other thing, every other state would, you know, one would be free, one would be slave, and this is how they were going to, again, maintain this sectional balance. Um, but the U.S. went to war with Mexico in 1848, and by 1850, had a whole bunch of new territory. And the idea that slavery was not going to spread was, uh, well, it was untenable for many people. And so you see slavery starting to creep up above that original line. This is territory gained from the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. You start to see it creeping up above that line like it was not supposed to. And then only four years later, we have the Kansas-Nebraska Act, wherein Congress basically declared that slavery is the will of the people. If the people of the territories want to own enslaved people, then that is their, their right, and they should be able to if they want to. So again... We get territory in the Nebraska and Kansas territories. This causes a little war called Bleeding Kansas. Um, it's basically another precursor to the Civil War. The tension is just mounting further and further. Um, you have John Brown's attack on Harper's Ferry in 1858. Um, but in the middle of all this, the Missouri courts, they're no longer finding in favor of the once free, always free doctrine. They're denying them their freedom. Um, it takes 11 years for it to end up in the Supreme Court. So by 1857, the Supreme Court is hearing this case, and what they decide is why this is one of the final instances of the Supreme Court. First of all, they decide, not only do they, they deny the Scots their freedom, but the Supreme Court rules that nobody of African descent will ever be a citizen of the United States. Whether you're free or enslaved, whether you're born here or not, if you are of African descent, you are property, you are not a person, and you have no right to citizenship. And um, so there were already free black people in the North who were voting and, and taking part, part in juries and things like that. that. That meant that their citizenship was gone. And that meant that basically in 1808, that's when the United States stopped allowing uh, the importation of enslaved people. So after 1808, basically most of the enslaved people were born in the United States. There's 100,000 enslaved people in 1808. By the end of the Civil War, there's about 4 million. So that's a citizenship denied to 8.4 million people all at one time. And the Supreme Court also ruled that Congress doesn't have the authority to say that slavery is illegal in the territory. Um, you cannot tell a citizen what they can do with their property in the violation of the Fifth Amendment. Therefore, slavery is now legal. Thank you.
or they didn't have the skills and knowledge to fight. You know, because of the white supremacy. It was pretty much so, yeah. It was what it is. But my great uncle, Uncle Tyson, they tried to fight it. I remember them talking about trying to fight it. And they still didn't be angry. And the, going to the library, all that stuff. And we often still think about, oh, that's a lot of money. Mm -hmm. That is a lot of money. And but it, it didn't get passed on to us. So, when, when I hear about this reparation, it's so important because you lost so much. You lost, you know, you lose so much, you know, but you still stay there. So that's my story with that. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And we, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, you know, we have our King Demetrius. We love him so much. He made sure that he captures everything for our families and his memories that we wouldn't obtain, have obtained otherwise. So. Um, thank you all for coming to listen to us studio. Thank you, Trey, also, Monique, um, for having me come here. When we talk about reparations, um, I was just thinking about being in the courtroom uh, when it came to uh, me listening to what Derek showed the attorney was basically indicating. Um, he was basically stating that his client, um, by the name of Derek Children, could have not killed George Floyd for the simple fact that George Floyd was 240 pounds in the state of Derek Children, only more 140 pounds. He said he had to have from a fentanyl overdose. So attorney Jerry Blackwell stated to us, he said, well, wait a minute, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, we must also take this into consideration. He said Derek Children not only more hundred and forty pounds, but he also had on a bulletproof vest. He also had on a service weapon with three extra clips. He also had a taste on him. He also had his nightstick. He also had his handcuffs. He also had his mace cam. He also had his clothing on. He said to add insult to injury, he put his hand in his pocket and crowded down and applied more pressure. He stated he did not let up. He did not get up. He did not let up. He did not get up, right? Once he said that, that pierced the soul to hear how cocky a, a man can be. Um, if you've ever seen the movie called um, The Black Judas, when he said, you went in this bar and you went in here with a fake FBI ID. Why would you do that? And he said, the FBI is one of the biggest gangs in the world. The biggest gangs in the world. He said, I know one, nobody challenged this. Nobody would challenge this. So when we talk about reparations, we're talking about people coming together and standing in solidarity, despite the fact the color, the race, and what have they. But we must admit, America does have a problem, right? Right? We must admit that. So once we are able to admit that, we can address that. And not only that, we give compensation to all the people. I see some amazing family members in here who have been impacted as well. Um, loved ones locked up, loved ones that's um, been killed, um, wrongfully by police officers, right? And then when police officers get killed by uh, an African-American race, it's an all-out war of African-Americans. It's always been that, you know what I'm saying, just so we clear. So people need to be careful of uh, calling the law enforcement when it's something that's really not um, what you think it is because a domestic can turn out to be a homicide. So this is exactly what they do. Not to mention what they take yeah. care of the police officers' families. Yeah, yeah. They have to worry yes. about who don't take care of us. That part, right. right. Yeah. <laughs> and, and as we see, um, two officers was killed. Our deepest is known to them. Well, what about the, the, the other people who have been impacted? The yeah. women and them truly. Yeah. 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 No one said anything yeah. about yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. It's right. about the trauma yeah. that they're going through. Right. Right. Not only that, the backslash that they don't have to receive mm -hmm. for the rest of their life. You know what I'm saying? So that's a whole other big for them. Um, but thank you all for coming out. I don't want to hold you all too long. But we do have cards over here for $5. We got books for $30. Um, I will autograph them. Then we also have some images here. We're going to buy for 20 bucks. Um, if you guys want to help, if you guys want to donate, that would be amazing. This is Listen to Us Studio. The reason why I named it Listen to Us Studio because I wanted to make sure that it was not just about me. It was a nation of people who were out here documenting what happened in Minneapolis and St. Paul. So, and it's very important for a person to listen yeah. to a beautiful ear. So we can get us in depth with that's part right there. Thank you, Trey. Thank you, Monique. Thank you, amazing people, for coming here. Yeah. Very, very, very. <laughs> 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 <laughs>